Welcome back everyone to the channel. Tonight's terrifying video, I am bringing you seven horrifying Wendigo encounter stories. Stick around because it's about to get spooky. My girlfriend is a perfect 10, no doubt about it. She's intelligent, witty, lights up the room, and is more than just easy on the eyes. But every Persian rug has its flaws. Hers is that she never eats. Let me start at the beginning. I can't say our meeting was particularly funny or quirky. It doesn't even make that good of a story. We met at a bar. I'm not exactly the outgoing type, so I can't even claim I won her over with a clever pickup line or anything like that. She just came and sat beside me, smiled and asked, Hey, you want to buy me a drink? Now I was pretty sure she was just looking for a free drink, but damn if that smile didn't seem worth of a few bucks to keep around a little longer. So I agreed. As the night went on, Things got a bit fuzzy as I knocked a few back. I remember we joked and laughed far longer than most of my conversations last, and at some point, I even got her name, Wendy, and number. But looking back, there was one odd part of the whole night. She never ordered any drink after that first one, and when we left, her glass was still full. I don't think she actually drank a single drop that night. Well, anyway, fast forward a bit. And after a bit of back and forth texting, I got up the nerve to ask her out for a date. Despite all of our texting, I was more than a little surprised when she said yes. Again, it wasn't anything special. We were just going to have some dinner and watch a movie. But when we met up, she explained that she had already eaten, something to do with an old friend coming to town. But she told me I could buy her a drink while I ate. Again, looking back, I don't remember her having a single drink. Though at one point, she must have. When I returned from using the restroom, her glass was half empty. After that, we went to see Rocky Horror Picture Show. It was a temporary run for Halloween, and generally had a good night. Things went on like that for a while. We'd make plans, but she'd always have an excuse to not eat anything. Sometimes, she had forgotten and already ate. Other times, she was trying out a new diet. But whatever it was, we never really had dinner together. As time went on, We'd meet up for something new in town, drinks, movies, etc., and always ended up at my place after because it was closer. You see, Wendy lived way outside of town, out in the boondocks, she always said. At one point, I asked why she lived out there, but she said she enjoyed the solitude, adding that the forest at night was a thing of beauty. I told her she was a thing of beauty. She laughed it off and made me forget about my questions for a bit. But after that, I kept asking about it, wondering if I could go check out this place that kept her so entranced that she didn't want to move the town. Finally, one night, she gave in to my pestering and invited me to visit her place. She was far enough out that she didn't really have any neighbors, and if you weren't careful, you'd easily miss her driveway as it looked more like a forest trail at a glance. When I first saw the place, I thought it looked more like a log cabin than a home, but she had power in a satellite dish, so we could still watch TV cuddled up on her couch together. Without going into too much detail, we had a pleasant evening and I ended up staying over. Things got a little weird when I woke up in the middle of the night alone in the bed. I got up and used the restroom, only to find that she hadn't returned when I got back. 
That's when I started hearing the sounds. Outside the house, I could hear something large moving. It was grunting and growling as if it was dragging something. A moment later, I heard wet tearing sounds as it seemed to be scarfing down something, a lot of something. It was more than a little unnerving. I was thinking about making a break for my car when it got quiet. A moment later, I heard the front door open and close. Wondering if it was Wendy or something else, I decided to check it out. Sure enough, Wendy stood just inside the door, but the odd thing was she was stark naked. I was slightly concerned, but when I asked what happened, she just shrugged and said, There was a bear outside digging in the trash, so I chased him off with this. She held up a can of bear spray. It almost made sense. Not that I'd be willing to go confront a bear in the middle of the night, but then again, I was a city boy who didn't know any better. So maybe country folk, her words not mine, just treat bears like oversized raccoons. However, there is still one glaring question that I had to ask. But why did you go out there naked? She looked down at herself and laughed. Well, I suppose I don't have to worry about clothing out here all that often. I don't get many guests, and there aren't any neighbors. I guess I just forgot. That was more than a little odd, but everyone has their quirks, and it wasn't worth starting a fight in the middle of the night. I decided to shrug and leave it be. The next morning, I woke up to the smell of breakfast. I figured this was it. I was finally going to see Wendy eat something. Just as I got up, Wendy walked into the room, carrying a tray with two eggs, some toast, and orange juice, but it only looked like one serving. When I asked her if we were sharing, she laughed and said, Oh, I already ate earlier. I had to admit, the food was good, but I was somewhat frustrated. Why did she never eat in front of me? I was just about to ask this question when she excused herself to use the bathroom. Realizing this was my chance, I snuck over to the fridge to look inside. Inside the refrigerator was one egg carton, missing precisely two eggs, one container of orange juice, missing just about one glass worth of juice, a loaf of bread, missing two slices of bread, and some butter which looked to be like missing just a few scrapes. There was nothing else, not even a condiment. The only food missing was easily accounted for by my breakfast. When I heard her finishing up, I snuck back into the bedroom and pretended to be finishing breakfast. The rest of the day went by pretty normal, and I headed home in the early afternoon. However, as I was leaving, I noticed the bear spray she had left by the front door still had the little plastic security tag in place, meaning it had never been used. After I got home, I decided to do a little digging. It turns out that around where Wendy lives, there have been reports of several missing hikers and campers. The most recent was a family that disappeared the same night that I stayed over. Combined with the fact that she never eats, well, let's just say I'm starting to get concerned. She's never shown any aggression or hostility to me, but next week, we were planning on going camping together, and I'm beginning to wonder if that's not such a good idea. I just want to start by saying that dating is hard. Once you get past all the bots, ads, and scammers and meet a real person, the guessing game begins. Why is this person actually available right now? Are they really just down on their luck, or is it something else that you're happier not knowing? Then, once you figure out their deep dark secrets, the question becomes, are they willing to put up with your deep dark secrets? 
This process can take weeks to sort out, usually resulting in a dead end somewhere, forcing you to start over. The whole thing is frustrating, demeaning, and embarrassing enough that you're physically and emotionally exhausted, making you just want to give up and be a loner. Now I know what you're wondering. What's this got to do with anything? Well, it's kind of simple. A little bit ago, I wrote about how my girlfriend, Wendy, never eats and that I heard something unsettling at her house the last time that I visited. Well, I decided to keep seeing Wendy. Sure, she might have some unusual habits, but she makes me feel good about myself and I'm happy with her. So what if she never eats or chases off bears while nude in the middle of the night? Compared to returning to the dating scene, that's really not so bad. We even have nicknames for each other now. Country Girl and City Boy. I'll let you guess which is which. Anyways, that's a rather long and roundabout way of saying that, yeah, I went on that camping trip with her and things didn't go quite how I expected. First off, I want to say that she was right. The forest really is beautiful. The sun's heat, combined with the coolness of the shade, while listening to the insects drone lazily in the background, seems to slow time to a crawl, making each breath a relaxing experience in and of itself. It's entirely unlike anything you'd ever experience during your morning commute. Combine all that with the right company, and soon you'll wonder why you'd ever return. And let me tell you, Wendy is 100% the right company. Wendy was quick with tips to make the hike easier. From how to properly distribute your pack load to how to lace your shoes for a maximum comfort. During the trek to where we were going to set up camp, she altered between offering interesting bits of information about the local flora and fauna and walking in silence, allowing me to get lost in the experience. The whole affair made me want to give up the city life and move to the country. There was just one thing during the walk that wasn't as pleasant as everything else. At one point, we must have walked too close to a skunk or a rotted carcass or something because the whole area around us started to reek. At first it wasn't so bad, but eventually it got so strong it made me want to gag. I jokingly mentioned it to Wendy, but she just looked ahead like she was determined and told me, Pick up the pace, we'll be past it soon enough. Sure enough. We eventually got past the smell, and things quickly became pleasant again. The rest of the hike passed without incident, and Wendy even helped me set up the tent. Her evident experience in the matter showed through because it took no time. Soon enough, everything was ready, and we even had a nice, cheerful fire roaring. This time, when she pulled out the supplies for dinner, I didn't even bat an eye when it was clearly only enough for one. Whatever was going on with her, this was just the way it was going to be. It was up to me to accept that or move on, and I had made my call. But I have to say, for someone who never seems to eat, she sure knows how to sear a steak to perfection. After a pleasant evening and an even more pleasant night, we passed out in the tent together while listening to the crickets and the more distant owls. But of course, if that's all that happened, I wouldn't be writing about it here. Sometime during the night, I awoke to find I was alone in the tent. This wasn't too unexpected because Wendy was both an outdoor enthusiast and a bit of a night owl. I debated calling out to her, but something in the air felt like I shouldn't disturb it with such an out-of-place sound. However, Mother Nature did have her demands, and it was time to answer her call. As I unzipped the tent and stepped out, I couldn't help but look up into the night sky. The stars were breathtaking. You never see this many this vibrant in the city. 
However, their beauty couldn't distract me for long in the face of more urgent demands. Do you know that feeling when you've been holding it in a little too long and finally experience relief? If it weren't for my experiences earlier that night, I might be tempted to claim that it was better than sex. But we'll just say that it's still pretty euphoric. Maybe it distracted me from the fact that all the usual night sounds had suddenly gone quiet. But it couldn't distract me from the sudden smell of rotting flesh. It was even stronger than it had been on the trail, and was accompanied by the kind of fear that you usually feel when you're very young and just starting to wonder if there might be reasons for the sounds that go bump in the night. I gagged as I struggled to cut off midstream zip up my pants, and retreat back into the tent again. Once in the tent, I reached for the flashlight, then hesitated. I desperately wanted to see better, but something in the back of my mind told me it was better to remain hidden. Of course, I don't know how well hidden the blue tent in the middle of the forest can be, but turning on a flashlight would make it actively a beacon for everything within a few miles to see. I sat in the dark for I don't know how long, feeling my heart pound through my chest loud enough that I was sure whatever was out there could hear it clearly. Thankfully, the smell eventually faded, but I was still so high on adrenaline that I knew I wouldn't sleep another wink for the rest of the night. Or so I thought. The following day, I awoke with Wendy cuddled in my arm, with one of her legs and arms draped over me. And once again, she was totally nude. Now, I was pretty sure she put on some pajamas before going to bed. But as she stirred and I got a good look at what was on display, I suddenly didn't care all that much. Eventually, she smiled lazily up at me and spoke. You sleep all right, city boy? You seem to have some pretty rough dreams in the middle of the night. At the time... Those words made perfect sense. In the light of day, it seemed pretty clear that whatever happened last night was probably just a vivid dream brought on by the experiences of the day before in an unfamiliar environment. After a bit more time together, we decided to get up and tackle another day in the forest. However, when I finally crawled out of the tent, I could see our entire camp was in disarray. It was like something had gone through and tossed everything around. A few of the more delicate items were totally demolished. After a moment, I called out, Uh, hey, you might want to take a look at this. As Wendy crawled out of the tent, she made a face. Must have been a bear. They usually don't come out this way, so I wasn't too worried about them. I guess that's on me, sorry. A bear. That kind of made sense. At least, I told myself so. As we were cleaning up, I even saw tracks. Though in my inexperience as a city boy, I would have said they belonged to a dog, not a bear. A huge dog. Maybe a wolf. What was even odder was when I found what looked to be like hoof prints. Looking at the prints... I realized that deer must be much bigger than they looked on TV since they were more than twice as long as my hand. There isn't much more to say about the day. We fixed the place up, had breakfast, went on a hike, made dinner, and called it a night, with a few other minor activities sprinkled throughout. I was back to enjoying the trip, so much so that I mostly had forgotten about the night before. But that night is when things took a bit of an unexpected turn. Once again, I awoke in the middle of the night. Thankfully, I wasn't alone this time, as Wendy was still asleep, half on top of me again. However, that stench was back and stronger than ever. It was amazing how bright it seemed in the tent. It must have been a full moon, or at least nearly full, because I could clearly see the shadow of a large deer pass between us and the night sky. But there was something wrong with this deer. It was clearly too tall, as if it was standing on hind legs, 
and when it opened its mouth, I could even make out a mouthful of very sharp teeth. I couldn't help it. I felt myself breathing more heavily by the second as my heart rate skyrocketed. My mind went blank when I suddenly felt Wendy stir. Remembering the presence of my considerably smaller girlfriend, I suddenly felt protective, as if I couldn't let anything happen to her. I was just about to tell her to be quiet when I noticed her looking at me with a finger on her lips, as if telling me to do the same. Then she whispered to me, Stay in the tent, and started to get up. I don't know what I was thinking or if I was thinking. All I knew was I couldn't let Wendy go out the face whatever that was. So I reached out and grabbed her wrist before she could exit the tent. However, when she looked back at me, I realized immediately, almost as scared of her as whatever was outside the tent. Her eyes reflected light back at me like a cat's, and I could see the nails on her hands growing as I watched. In a half a moment, she turned back around, opened the tent, and climbed outside. I will never forget the sound I heard that moment. After I got home, I looked up the calls of a bunch of wild animals, and in hindsight, I'd say it was like a combination of an elk call, a rabbit scream, and a mountain lion scream, but impossibly loud. Wendy shouted an answer, her tiny human voice sounding so frail in comparison. At least it did until it started to change, morphing and twisting into the howl of an impossibly large wolf. I couldn't help it. I peeked out of the tent, and standing in front of the tent was what I could only describe as a werewolf. The little five-foot-and-change Wendy was now standing at least seven feet tall, covered in fur with claws and fangs that looked like they could tear through steel, and she looked ready for murder. Then, some movement on the opposite end of our camp drew my attention, and I witnessed a living nightmare that suddenly made a werewolf seem like less of a problem. It looked kind of like a deer, if a deer had more articulated limbs far too long for its body. The feet ended in hoofs, but the hands ended in long bony claws. The whole thing looked desiccated, its skin drawn so tight over its ribs and arms you could make out the skeleton beneath. The fur was spotty and looked partially rotted, with open holes leaking bodily fluids that should never see light. Its teeth were long and serrated, clearly meant for tearing rather than chewing. I sometimes hear hunters talking about deer being 8 or 10 points, but if I had to estimate, this thing had a 30-point antler, with many of the tines covered in what I suspected to be dried viscera from previous victims. The two monsters charged each other. The nightmare, which I now knew was a wendigo, lowered its head, intending to impale its opponent. But at the last second, Wendy threw herself nearly flat on the ground, only to rocket up at the wendigo, latching onto its neck with her powerful jaws, while her hind feet kicked gouges into its vulnerable stomach. However, the Wendigo didn't seem willing to give up so easily and tossed Wendy aside. She hit the ground hard and was soon set upon by the other monster. She raised an arm to defend herself, only for the Wendigo to latch on with its own teeth, easily tearing through her skin and muscles. With a powerful kick, Wendy pushed the nightmare back, then started swiping at him over and over, making it loose ground. However, lowering its head, the Wendigo charged forward again, and this time, Wendy wasn't fast enough as the Wendigo caught her in its antlers and flipped her onto its back, with new blood darkening the tips of the tines. But that was its downfall as Wendy sprung up and again latched onto its neck with her teeth, this time from behind. The nightmare struggled in vain, occasionally raking Wendy with its claws, but she refused to let go and began ripping and tearing her way through its neck until she grabbed a hold of its antlers, and with one final jerk, the head came free.
I don't have a heart to describe what happened next. But let's just say the sound of flesh being torn and eaten is much more distinct through the thin membrane of a tent than a closed cabin window. Time passed. At least an hour. Maybe two or three. It's hard to say for sure. I don't know what I expected to happen next. Maybe I was going to be next. Or perhaps I'd wake up from this nightmare. But eventually, the adrenaline passed. My eyes grew heavy, and I fell asleep again. When I awoke in the morning, I was alone this time. There was no sign Wendy had come back. I half hoped she would still be here, telling me that I had another nightmare, but I don't think I could believe it again. It was kind of sad and lonely packing up the things by myself. I debated bringing Wendy's stuff with me, but I'm not a good hiker and wasn't confident I'd pull it off. So I just left her things in her pack inside the tent. When I exited the tent, I was more than a little surprised to see Wendy sitting calmly by the fire pit with no wounds in sight. She smiled sadly. So, I guess I owe you an explanation. I remember hesitating, my mind blank before I settled on the thought I had earlier. What, you're not going to try to convince me it was a nightmare again? She looked around at all the destruction at the campsite. Earth was kicked up, trees had claw marks gouged out, and there were signs of blood splatter everywhere. I don't think I could convince you this time. I nodded as I looked around. Yeah, I guess not. Then I looked back at her. You know, for a bit there, I was starting to think you were the monster eating people out there. Wendy pointed at herself, then laughed. Wait, me? Wendy the Wendigo? Don't you think that's a little too on the nose? I couldn't help it. As disturbing as everything I learned was, this was the Wendy I knew and cared for. So, I laughed with her. Yeah. Maybe so. Long story short, we're still together. Sure, my girlfriend might be a seven foot tall werewolf that eats other monsters for fun, but everyone has their quirks. Besides, dating is hard, and I'm happy where I am. All know the feeling of hunger, and yet some have never seen it. You yourself may have claimed to be starving, empty, famished, or hungry. But have you yourself ever encountered the merciless beast we call hunger? Have you ever considered that the thing you call starving is only the fingernail of the monster that plagues the mists and souls of the innocent and sane? Breathing down your neck and clawing at your skin and blood-covered nails, desperate to get inside, only blocked from you gobbling down cheeseburgers, pizza, donuts, fruits, and veggies? And yet some have come close to hunger. Some of the worst instances of mass hunger known as famines have plagued us for centuries. Ireland, 1845. Russia, 1921. China, 1959. And yet even in these stages of hunger, when people's teeth were gnawing and broken from eating leather and dirt, and animals had a feast of the bones and rotted flesh of human remains, very few have ever seen hunger. Few have seen the Wendigo. All the Wendigo ever feels is hunger, for it is hunger. You may have heard of the Wendigo, seen drawings of it, but for the few that have seen it, for most, it was the last thing they saw. I haven't seen it, no, thank God I haven't seen it. Yet the blood that runs in my family have seen it, stared at it in its hollow eyes. This is not my story, this is my father's. When I was around the age of 15, he told me to sit down next to him, 
pointing to the brown cloth chair. I was old enough to know, he told me, why he never let me set foot in the woods. Why we never go up north, especially never when it's winter. I recorded it all he requested for that, wanting a record of what happened to him, to make sure no one else went through it like he did. This is what he told me. Father's Story he takes out his cigarette and clicks the lighter until a small blaze puts the small flame to his cigarette, taking a puff before starting. My uncle decided it was time for me to visit the Great Lakes forests. Told me the woods were some of the most beautiful in the whole country. It took a lot of convincing until your grandfather decided it was fine for me to visit the north. Of course, when he made the decision... It was winter by then. The winter down here is a light breeze compared to the freeze up in the north. Cold days and dark icy nights. It's a wonder how the Native Americans managed to survive months of thick snow and the creatures that came from it. He paused to take another puff of his cigarette before continuing. This didn't stop my uncle who had prepared in case we had to go out during the winter. He, for both me and him, as if we were going to the Arctic, thick puffy pants, fat boots and gloves, as well as goggles in case we came upon a storm on a walk, as well as bear spray if we came across wild animals. He also packed something else. A 50 Action Express Desert Eagle. The ones that cops use in the movies. He didn't actually expect to use it. It was just in case we came across a bear or a lynx and things got too close and personal. He pauses and stares at his right leg. He definitely didn't think we needed it for something different. It was around mid-November when we took the plane to the state of Michigan. He had purchased a standard hotel room in a small town. He refuses to mention the name and we spent the most few days simply getting used to the sceneries of where we were. My uncle was right. It was beautiful. Actually, I don't even think the word beautiful cuts it. I could see the edge of the forest by my window. They were tall, like long hairs protruding from the head of Mother Nature. And along those hairs lied the fleas, squirrels, chipmunks, birds... And the occasional wolf and fox would pass by, before disappearing in the shadow of the trees. I tell you, even now I do miss seeing the trees, watching the wind blow the tall fines in harmony. He sighs, and puts out his cigarette on his wooden chair. But I know I could never go back there. Almost every day we went on hikes with the snow crunching beneath our feet, stopping every so often to witness the wildlife. Once or twice we came across a bear. I was scared, of course, but my uncle had faced plenty in his time living there, so of course he knew what to do. Don't look at them in the eyes, he would whisper to me as he pulled out his bear spray just in case. And eventually, it would move along, searching for some berries to eat. It was around our second week there that my uncle decided to take me on my first night walk. So we put on our coats, snow boots, and brought along the bear spray and desert eagle. It was somehow even more gorgeous in the dark than it was in the day. The stars flowed above us like fireflies welcoming us in the forest, as the moon as big and bright as ever hovered above us. We walked until we came up to a fork in the path. We usually would go left, as it was much longer so we could experience the forest longer. But it was a lot colder than usual, so my uncle decided it was best to get back sooner rather than later. For some reason, the cold weather did hang in my mind for longer than it should have. Although the weather could be unpredictable, the weather news where I was was more accurate than the ones down in the north. This thought slept with my mind eventually, reasoning that every news channel got it wrong eventually. So we continued, 
But as we went, it just kept getting colder and colder. My uncle repeatedly kept looking at the sky, with a bewildered look on his face. Looking up, I saw not a single cloud in the sky. Nothing to indicate a snowstorm was coming, or anything that would cause the weather to get this cold. Soon my uncle put me close to him, to make us warmer. It wasn't a long hike back, just a mile or more. Then it was clear something was wrong, more than the weather. As we kept walking, we heard steps, fast steps. My uncle jerked his head in that direction, instinctively pulling out his bear spray. Looking past him, I could clearly see several pairs of eyes in the shadow of the trees, moving fast, moving towards us. My uncle had quickly raised the bear spray and put himself in front of me, screaming to get back. Looking over, I could now clearly see it was a wolf, mouth open, panting and stamping its feet on the ground, creating louder cracks as the snow fell beneath them. Looking up, Uncle had his fingers straight on the bear spray trigger, ready to blast them straight in the faces. Then the wolves ran right past us. I mean, right past us. They were maybe ten feet away from us at most. Moving so fast, I could feel a small gust of wind pushing against my face. My uncle put down the bear spray and looked around Dusty, in complete utter confusion encompassing his whole face. That's when I saw more eyes. He motioned his hand in a circle around him. There had been dozens of critters and birds, running. They didn't even stop to look at us. They were just running. All the animals I had feared, all the critters and birds, all sorts of things in the woods I had stared at in amazement just days before. All of them were running. I never seen anything like it in my life, nor did my uncle. He decided that it was time to go, most likely because whatever the animals were running from was something we did not want to come across. Now my uncle was someone that doesn't get scared easily. From the stories your grandfather told me, he had faced death more times than he could count. Coming across an angry grizzly, a hungry pack of wolves, and even someone pointing a gun at him straight in the face. Even then, I didn't see fear in his face, but looking into his eyes, I could see worry, and that was enough I needed to know. Our standard walk had turned into a jog, with Uncle deciding that it would be fast to go off trail through the woods. On the trail, there was a clear opening overhead for the light of the moon and stars to shine through, but off trail, the pine needles blocked most of the light that came through, with small beams piercing the thick hide here and there. My uncle just kept walking straight, straight towards the town. He probably just had a half a mile when he suddenly stopped, making me bump into his back. He didn't move, almost like he had stopped breathing. Uncle? I asked in a squally voice. I looked ahead of him my heart pounding against my sternum as it pumped blood like a bicycle pump. Up ahead was the outline of a person, though it was too far away to see any facial features or any features at all. I don't know, 30 seconds before my uncle started backing up, gesturing me to do the same. Hello? Can we help you? I heard a tremble. It was a small one but it was enough to tell me everything I needed to know. My uncle, one of the coolest people I'd ever known, was scared. Slowly, ever so slowly, my uncle put his hand behind his back, moving towards the bear spray. But my eyes nearly popped out when his hand went past the bear spray and moved towards the gun. Crack. Up ahead, I heard what sounded like a small twig break, and breaking eye contact with my uncle's hand looked forward back at the figure. He had taken a step forward, stepping on a small branch that poked out of the layer of snow. And with that snap, there was a new feeling in the air, 
And it wasn't the cold. It wasn't fear. It was hunger. An almost lustful amount of hunger. Look, my uncle said, as his hand still gradually moved towards the Desert Eagle. We don't want any trouble. We're just trying to get back to town, so if you could please... He didn't get to finish his sentence. By this point, my father stopped looking at me, instead looking out the window. It all happened too fast. First, there were the steps. Fast, rampant. Each step came with a snarl. It was too fast for my uncle. Too fast for me to process. What came next was the gunshot. It rang off the trees, bouncing back into my ears, making them ring like a church bell. He got one shot off before it got to us. One shot off before it made him scream. It slammed into him, flinging both me and his gun to the left, slamming me to the ground with a loud thud which knocked the wind right out of me. Oh god, the screams. It didn't kill him quickly. I didn't see it happen, but I heard the crunch of teeth going through flesh and meeting bone. It probably stopped there for a second to savor the taste of the blood against its rotted teeth before it continued. I'm glad I didn't see it happen, but I could well damn hear it. Splish and splash as blood poured on the ground as it continued to sink its teeth into his flesh, seemingly hard for it to hold back. It had enough of the taste, now it wanted to eat. Crunch after crunch came, followed by tearing and popping sounds. I think it was pulling the organs out of his stomach. I don't know how long my eyes were closed, but the time I opened them, I was facing away from them and looking at the light that bounced off a silver object, the Desert Eagle. I stood up, shaken from the fall. The funny thing, I wasn't scared. My brain must have taken a hit, making it difficult for me to process what was happening behind me. I took a casual step forward towards the gun, cracking the snow beneath my feet, and that's when the crunching stopped. That's when I remembered where I was. We both turned at the same time, its eyes meeting mine, and my eyes meeting it for if you could call them eyes. I say this because I don't even know if they were eyes. They were black and hollow, and I say black because all that was there in those eyes were black. Then there was the rest of its body. I couldn't believe that that thing that did this to my uncle was unbelievably skinny. Its ribs poked out of its chest, bones clearly seen through its slender arms and legs. There were antlers that looked like that of a deer protruding from its head. He pauses and then thinks for a moment. No, it wasn't a head. It was a skull. Because that's what it looked like. A skull with deer antlers coming from the top of its head. And even as it crouched, I could see it was tall, even towering over me in that stance. We both stared at each other for what felt like hours before it turned back around and continued eating what was left of my uncle. Did it even care that I was there? Why did it not attack me next? Just get it over with. I didn't stop to ask these questions. I just turned, picked up the gun, and ran. For a second, I considered taking a shot, but I didn't know if the bullet my uncle shot at it hit it, and if it did, then I don't even think the bullets affect the thing. All I knew was that I had to get away. So I kept running and running and running. What probably just took 10 minutes felt like an eternity. And then I saw the lights of the town. I'm gonna make it, I thought. Hope creeping up my spine and into my brain. And that's when I heard the distant footsteps. I turned around for a split second and felt that hope come crashing down all the way to my toes. There it was, probably just a thousand meters away. I could see its eyes. They weren't glowing or anything, 
They were just so black, they stood out even in the darkness. And it was running. Running fast. I couldn't believe my eyes how fast this thing was running. I would bet all of my money that this thing could easily beat a gazelle high on cocaine. I turned my head back around and continued running, putting all my strength and energy into my legs to just get away from this thing. But the steps just kept getting closer and closer. Now today, I understand why it didn't eat me before. Because it knew no matter how much I tried to run, it would never fail to catch me. And it did. A jolt of pain tore through my entire leg when it clamped its teeth into my leg, the teeth reaching my femur and making a small crack in it. This thing had unimaginable strength, picked me up from its mouth, and flung me a few dozen feet. I landed head first, shock and pain in my head, spreading throughout my entire body, but soon the pain was going away as I felt myself slipping away out of consciousness. In the background, I heard it crunching, savoring the little bit of meat it got out of my leg. This is it. This is how I was going to die. I believed it. I truly believed it. But then I heard, Get up! It was my uncle. You aren't going down that easy, are you? The words were all I needed. Every emotion in my body, hopelessness, fear, sadness, despair, were all replaced by one. Rage. I turned around and pointed the gun which I managed to keep a hold of and pointed it straight at its face. It turned, seemingly shocked that I had a weapon in my hand, but soon after, it charged. I wasn't aiming for anything, just pulled the trigger. Almost seemingly in slow motion, I saw the bullet fly and go straight into the void of one of its eyes. Time stopped for just a second. Then it stumbled backward, grabbing its face and I heard it scream. For the first time in the recording, I saw fear flicker in my father's eyes, and then he continues. When I saw it open its mouth, I expected a monstrous bellow or a loud shriek, but what came out was worse. It wasn't the sound of a monster, but the sound of people, hundreds of people, men and women screaming in pain and agony. The elderly shrieked in terror. I could hear babies crying and toddlers screaming as if they were denied a toy. But one scream remained in my mind forever. The only reason I can't forget about what happened that day. Because I heard a specific scream come out of its mouth. The scream of my uncle. The rage was gone and the terror returned. I got back up and continued running towards the light. I didn't want to get away from it. I just wanted to get away from the horrible screaming. But I couldn't. I just couldn't. No matter how fast I ran, the dreams stayed the same. But then it changed, for it was no longer screaming of pain, but screams of rage. I continued to run. I had to get away. I wanted to. I needed to. My femur's crack was continuing to grow as I continued to run. My lungs pressed against my rib cage as my body demanded a huge amount of oxygen that the lungs could not provide. I remember bursting through the woods, welcomed by the bright street lamps and the hard pavement beneath my boots. And when I had burst through out of the woods, my body had used up all its strength and I fell. The last memory I got before blacking out was the screech of tires. A man looking over me on the phone, and before I lost consciousness, I turned my head towards the woods. I saw it standing there, one eye closed, the other empty eye staring at my own. I didn't need to see its face to know how it felt. It was angry. It hated me. And it was still hungry. I woke up the next day in the town's hospital. By that time, it had been three days. 
and your grandfather had flown over once he had heard the news. I was greeted with tears and warm hugs after he saw me awake. I told him and everyone else everything about the thing, about uncle, everything. They didn't believe me. Probably thought the number of hits I took on my head made me reimagine a little old bear as a monster. They did send out a search party. However, didn't find it, but found my uncle. The rumors spread about every bit of flesh, blood, organ, and even the bone marrow was stripped clean. And all that was left was a cluster of bones. He sighs. That Wendigo is probably still out there, continuing to eat innocent people. Continuing to hate me for being the one that got away. And there's more out there. More that will not stop until they are full. And they are never full. And never will be. He pauses. The most disturbing thought I have is that of my uncle's voice in my head when that thing had had me on the ground. Sometimes I think, was it actually my uncle's voice telling me to get up? Or was it that thing telling me to get up, wanting me to put up a little more fight so it could make the kill so much easier? An apex predator is a predator which has no natural predators of its own. Put quite simply, a predator at the top of the food chain. You may very well think that humans are the most apex of apex predators. In a way, though if you asked anyone who lived around here, you would find that they would disagree with you. The earliest written accounts of it come from the first Europeans to have ever colonized this area. Though that only holds true for the written accounts. The Native Americans who lived here had many stories about it, not that the Europeans had believed them at first. When they had first learned about the monster was the one responsible for eating their pigs, they took up their muskets and went looking for it. Those tales the natives told them couldn't possibly be real, they told themselves. Not to mention that they had superior weapons. What could possibly go wrong? Well, their corpses were found hanging from the trees the very next morning. Since then, a sort of mutual understanding, for a lack of a better term, has evolved between those of us who live here and it. Truth be told, although it could wipe us all out if it so chose to, it doesn't appear that it wants to. After all, it knows that it could wipe us out. But for what? From what the tales say, it doesn't think that we humans taste very good, and that lately we've been all bred on diets of junk food and who knows what else. I'm doubtably sure that it would not find us very appetizing. No, the rules are clear. There are areas of the woods that belong to it. You don't go into those areas or bring any animal you value near them. The night of the full moon belongs to it and you do not go anywhere in the woods on that night. And so, it was for several hundred years, perhaps even longer. No one could know for sure how long the oral tradition goes back to. As for me, I live near the woods. I go into them quite often, though I remember the rules that my father always told me, and things were always fine. Until last week. I think we all knew that there was something wrong. Huge flocks of birds flew away in all directions throughout the week, as if running away from something. Areas of the woods that were abundant with wildlife were now empty. But it didn't hit us just how wrong things had gotten until today. While trekking through the woods, I noticed I'd suddenly come to an area where all noises stopped. I would have turned to run if I had not noticed that there was indeed the noise that I hadn't noticed until everything came to a pin drop silence. The steady drip of a liquid falling to the floor, almost like a leaky faucet. But there was no faucets in the wilderness. There's something I should probably mention. 
I saw it. I saw the monster. Well, only a silhouette of the thing when I was eight years old. But it was so striking when I saw it that it was burned into my memory until this very day. That's how I know that I had really seen it. I saw it closer than I think any human had ever done until the day where they had lived to tell the tale. It was, for a lack of better word, majestic. It looked like an oversized deer, though it had two heads, one stacked above the other. Each head had six eyes, and its two mouths revealed stacks of teeth that resembled one of a carnivore's. It had a long tail ending in a stinger, and its abdomen had been opened, and it had just been impaled upon a tree. Its blood was still fresh as it dripped onto the floor. I turned and ran. There was something in these trees that had killed it, and that couldn't have been boded well for us. A new sound reached my ears, the thump of multiple large feet hitting the ground. I realized that whatever had killed it was chasing after me. I didn't dare look back. I just kept running. I think I would have definitely been done in for if I hadn't ran into a herd of deer on my way. They scattered as I approached them. No, now that I think about it, they must have feared that thing from behind me more than they feared me. But they just gave me enough time to escape. The creature seemed the delight on snatching one of them more than it did me. I got back to town and spread the word. It was gone. Now something else had taken its place. Five people had gone missing since then, and they had been wandering around areas that were previously safe. Safe only back when it still roamed the woods. I've sold my house, and I'm getting as far away from this place as I can. The thought of that creature follows me and haunts my dreams. And unlike with it, this creature isn't interested in sharing its territory. And woe to any person who hasn't realized that. There's always a bigger fish, after all. My boyfriend works late hours. And when I know he's on his way to my house, I sit and wait for him in the kitchen to greet him. The main door is in front of me while the back porch one is behind me. He tends to come in through that one so my dog doesn't bark. He called me a few minutes ago and said that he had just left work and he's on his way. So I did my normal and sat in the kitchen table scrolling on my phone until I got the I'm outside text. After a few minutes of scrolling, I heard his voice. The only light outside of my house was the porch light, so I looked out of the kitchen window and nobody's there. Baby, come outside. Normally his voice is reassuring and welcoming, but I had a terrible feeling and decided to call his cell phone. His phone is a track phone that he buys service for, so sometimes it simply rings twice, which is what it did every time I called. Eventually, I gave up and stepped into the back porch to look outside. Maybe his phone died and he needed me to unlock the front door. I could feel my heart drop as I remembered the door was unlocked. I started to text him, asking him to answer his phone. But while I'm doing this, the voice turns from a gentle tone to an angry tone. He yells my first name and told me to come outside. My boyfriend never calls me by my full name, and at this point I'm starting to feel scared. I looked out. I looked outside and it now knows that I'm not in the kitchen and that I looked out the back porch window. I called him again. After what felt like hours, he answered in a concerned way, apologizing because his phone was on vibrate as well as it not working. Why did you tell me to come outside? Those were the first words I said. There was an immediate silence over the phone. What do you mean? I'm just now on your road. He sounded worried, but I could tell he thought I was pranking him. The voice was getting angrier by the second. 
It cussed at me and eventually started banging on the door. It was so loud that even my boyfriend could hear it through the phone. I heard the car speed up, then the sound of gravel from him pulling into my driveway. I finally mustered up the courage to move the curtain and see if there was really anyone there. There was nothing there, but I could see him running up the stairs to get me. Once he got in, the voice and the banging came to a complete stop. I stood shaken while he looked around my yard only to see a deer running away on its hind legs, just for the front two to hit the ground in front of it as it went into the nearby woods. We didn't sleep much that night, and eventually we plan on moving somewhere that's closer to the city, as my house is out of the way from any other people. This is a story which happened to me and my friend a few years back. I work in a national park as a park ranger. When my life was relatively normal, I had just landed a job at a national park. Life was good as I was working with my buddy Rob. The second day was strange. We found bear traps on the ground. We never put them there. Other than that, another day in paradise, but throughout the night, I swore I heard a loud screech coming from the woods near my watchtower. I looked out and saw nothing. I just shrugged it off after a little while. As of lately, we had been finding small animal corpses around the woods. This is normal since we have bears all over. It's just that these marks were too big to belong to a bear. What's even weirder is we found a tooth inside of a bloody deer. This tooth was too large and sharp to belong to a bear. I think we have a new animal in these woods. Today we found a bear hanging from a tree and gutted. I nearly threw up. No animal in the park could do this. My boss told us from now on to stay at the watchtowers. I kept being reassured that everything would be fine. But at this point, I just couldn't be too sure anymore. Lately, the screeches have been more frequent. I'm having trouble focusing. When I was younger, I was told of a creature that fed off people and animals. It could also mimic voices. It was called a Wendigo. Of course, I didn't believe in the paranormal crap, but something was taking out animals throughout the park. I swear I heard Rob call me from outside of the watchtower. He yelled, Hey Trent, you gotta come see this. I nearly left, but I felt that his voice was off, nearly distorted. I looked out of my watchtower to see Rob, his insides dangling in the breeze. My boss rolled this out as an accident. That still didn't stop the police from questioning me. I know I heard his voice. I saw something in the woods. Let me explain. This creature I saw had huge antlers, an animal skull as a mask, and it was over 11 feet tall. The night began normally, until the screeching began again. I looked down, only to see this creature eating my boss's lifeless body. I got a good look at it before it ran off and out of sight. The police have been very suspicious of me lately. How could they not be? Both of the people I worked with were dead. I tried to explain what I saw to the police. Of course, nobody believes me. It all led to me being terminated. I've decided I'm not going to let this creature ruin my life. I've done research on this Wendigo. I plan to break into the park tonight. I will end this. I must. I'm in the park. I hear the screeches and I'm following them. I hear the voices of my boss and Rob. They are telling me that they are okay and I should come meet them by the watchtower. I know from my research that the Wendigo creature is really good at tricking people. I just kept wandering around the park. I was wandering until I heard my mother's voice. 
she died when I was six. My instincts told me no, but I had missed her so much. Don't worry, Mom. I'm coming. Last Friday, I was driving on a windy back road in the mountains of rural Utah. I was around 10 miles from the nearest town when my engine died. I pulled out my phone to look at the map. There was no service, but I had downloaded a map of the area just in case. I saw that if I followed the road, it, it was a 10 mile walk that wound back and forth along some back roads. I didn't like that idea very much. I also saw that the town was actually only two miles away as the crow flies. In a direction line from me, I just have to climb a little bit to cut my journey down. I shot a look up at the mountain, left a note on my car saying what I was doing and set off through the brush. That part of Utah didn't have much underbrush, just some scraggly bushes and the occasional tree clinging to life in the dry soil. I was making good time and soon had shut off my phone's light to rely on the moon which was a bright pearl in the sky. When my eyes had adjusted, it was almost like walking around in the daytime. The valley extended for dozens of miles to my right, and the weather was just only slightly chilly with the wind. That was when I heard a baby's cry low on the wind. It was far off in the distance to my left, slightly higher on the slope. I paused, listening hard. It came again, unmistakably the piercing short cry of a newborn infant. I paused for a moment before heading in the direction of the call. There was no one around for miles, and now this kid? After a few more minutes of walking, I stumbled across what must have been a hundred-year-old cemetery. There were no headstones. Just rocks marked the spots where people must have been buried. I couldn't hear any more crying. I took a short video walking around the cemetery, which you could see here. Video of the cemetery. I put my phone away in my back pocket, listening hard for the kid. I figured it must have been an animal. I thought I had heard that coyotes could mimic human cries. Then I turned to look at the moon, only now noticing that it had been ringed by thick dark clouds. Almost as if on cue, the clouds rushed forward. Over the course of five seconds, the cemetery went from lit up by moonlight to pitch blackness. The clouds must have been covering every star in the sky as well as the moon. The darkness was complete. I couldn't see my hand in front of my face. It was so black that it seemed almost physical, enveloping and dulling each of my senses. Then the baby cried again from my left, loud and piercing. I jerked, caught my foot on a rock and fell forward against one of the fences. The baby was shrieking loudly. It couldn't have been more than a few feet away. Just on the other side of the fence, I pushed back, sticking my hand into my pocket feeling for my phone to turn on a light. That's when the dry paper fingers slid around the back of my throat. Nails dug into the skin, and I thought I could hear a high raspy giggle from behind me just before it began the squeeze. I jerked forward, flipping on my light and spun around. There was nothing there. I ran, trying to put as much distance between myself and the cemetery as I could. When I finally reached the town, I put my hand up to my neck and felt the scrapes on my neck. I told myself it was just a tree, but I knew that it wasn't. I managed to get an old mechanic to come help me with my car. On the way back, I asked him a question about a cemetery up in the hills. He stiffened, looked at me and said, We don't go up there. We know better. 